Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. Affirmative action is back in the news as a federal judge has approved Harvard University's admissions program, which does count race as a factor in admission, even though that program may produce discrimination against Asian American students. And that case is probably headed to the Supreme Court in what may be a challenge to affirmative action far more broadly. My guest today is a, is the author of a new book that I am reading and thoroughly enjoying called The Affirmative Action Puzzle, A Living History from Reconstruction to Today. Melvin Urofsky, a professor emeritus of history at Virginia Commonwealth University. And we have a really wide-ranging conversation about what is affirmative action and what are some of the ways over the last 50 or 60 years that affirmative action has had to be put in place to make change, even as our laws have changed to tear down walls of desegregation and discrimination. But we are so far from being done on this issue, and it's not going to go anywhere anytime soon. So I think this is something that, uh, despite my fascination with American history, I really had to learn a whole lot about. I know you're going to enjoy my conversation with Mel Urofsky on affirmative action. So stay tuned. Today we are talking about affirmative action. Uh, depending on who you talk to, there's a real question as to what affirmative action even is. And even if people agree, they're going to have vastly different views on whether it's been a good thing or a bad thing or a mixed bag and all in between. And to help us understand that and sort through uh, these issues and also look ahead at the future, at the future of affirmative action is my guest today, Melvin Urofsky. Uh, Mel is a professor emeritus of history at Virginia Commonwealth University, he was the chair of the history department there, and he's the author of a fascinating book that I'm really enjoying reading called The Affirmative Action Puzzle, A Living History from Reconstruction to Today. So first of all, Mel, thank you so much for being on Good Law, Bad Law with me. Uh, my pleasure. So... Uh, we were just chatting, and we're going to get into the history, but there's a very recent decision out of a federal court in uh, Massachusetts involving Harvard that I think really nicely gives us a current hook on this issue that has been so uh, controversial and, and, uh, and, and so challenging as well. Uh, for a lot of decades now, and that's this case that comes out of the uh, Harvard admissions program. Uh, do you want to start by just telling us what that case involves and how that sets the table for us in talking about uh, affirmative action, both the successes and those things that may be a little bit harder to call a success? Well, the story actually starts with the man called Edward Bloom, um, who runs something called Students for Fair Admission. Uh, and he's been behind some other cases. And um, he wants to do away with affirmative action, race-based affirmative action altogether. Doesn't think it's constitutional, doesn't think it's fair. And it, one of the things I'm try I try to point out in the book is that this is not a simple conservative liberal fight. All the liberals are for it. All the conservatives are against it. You have um, probably the most liberal judge of the 20th century was William O. Douglas, and he opposed it. And so did Anthony Scalia. Now, Bloom uh, was upset at the way Harvard uh, was treating Asian American uh, applicants. The uh, percentage of Asian students has stayed pretty much for the last 10 years. Uh, and as far as Bloom was concerned, this meant that Harvard was using a quota, and they were discriminating against um, Asian-American applicants. The 
court found that while Harvard's admission process was very complicated, that uh, what they did was not unconstitutional. And I spoke to Bloom the day after the decision, and they had already started drawing up papers for an appeal. He's hoping it will go to the Supreme Court, which will reverse it. Mm -hmm. But one thing I think, and if I may continue on this, is of course Harvard discriminates, and so does every other elite school. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can use a personal example, I, um, when I applied to Columbia, it was all male. And they put the application, I learned all the following when I was a graduate student there working in the admissions and scholarship office. They put all the applicants from the five boroughs of Manhattan into one pile. They put all the applicants from a 50-mile radius, all the suburbs in Jersey, Westchester, Connecticut, into a second pile. And the third pile was everybody who was 50 miles and more beyond, which meant the rest of the world. Uh, fortunately, I was in that third group, so I didn't have to compete against the kids who graduated from Stuyvesant and Bronx Science. Columbia wanted to be an international school. They could have filled the entire class with applicants from Bronx Science. But if you stop the thing for a minute, Columbia fielded a football team. They fielded it. It wasn't very good, but they did field the football team. <laughs> I went to Columbia as well, by the way. <laughs> Okay, so you know, I mean, it, yes. it, you went up to Baker Field on Saturday with a blanket of flask and a girl, and you, you had a good time. Right. Um, they fielded a basketball team. They fielded a, a baseball team. They had a student newspaper that appeared five days a week. They had a debate club. They had a dramatics club. They had choral society, all sorts of things. And this didn't just happen. It wasn't that, you know, here we have this cutoff point of everybody with a 95 average and above, and look, we have football players, and look, we have basketball players. Right. They discriminated. It was a form of affirmative action where if you were needed for one of these activities, you got a boost. It wasn't formal, but the uh, admissions committee kept its eye out. And this is true of every other school in the country. Now, in some of them, like the Big Ten and uh, the big football powers, they have a complete, you know, completely separate admissions for um, uh, athletes, and that recent scandal out west, you know, really uh, happened because there were best uh, volleyball players who could get scholarships, that sort of thing. So yes, Harvard does discriminate, and so does Columbia, and so does every other of, of the elite schools. Um, they have to if they're going to have students who do all the things that are there for students to do. But there's a big difference between, on the one hand, discriminating against certain groups of people based on their race or ethnicity so that they don't get a shot at even applying or, or getting into a school like Harvard or Cal Berkeley or any other college or university and using uh, race as a way of giving somebody a boost, as you pointed out, in right. the same way that somebody who plays football very well would get a boost because they have to fill a football team. And those are very different things. And they that, are, And that's I'm where affirmative action... That. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, you can use race, but it has to be one of a number of certain things. So the normal thing is, like in employment, the rule is if you have two people... Uh, who apply for a job, you hire the better one no matter what the color of their skin. If they're both equally qualified, uh, you give a boost to uh, the person of color, um, which is not unfair considering that for years the, um, the quota for blacks, as Thurgood Marshall pointed out, was zero. The um, problem here at Harvard is once you start taking away... Um, positions that go to legacy students. That's a whole big different story, but mm -hmm. all the private universities have legacy students. That is, students whose parents went there, and they get a boost. And then if you take away the students that you need for athletics and extracurricular activities, you don't have a lot of spaces left. And at that point, what the schools are looking for is diversity. Um, and According to the Supreme Court, diversity is a compelling interest. And as someone who talked for more than half a century, I, I can tell you 
that it's a lot better to have a diverse student body that you're teaching. Um, when you teach civil rights, for instance, it's good to have some people of color in the class. Uh, if you're talking about some of the gender cases, it's good to have women in the class. Um, I mean, I don't know of any college teacher who doesn't value diversity. Well, uh, and, and it's, so... It's a fine line, though. It's a very fine line to walk. So maybe we have to step back then to, to understand... And this Harvard case, by the way, from what you've told us and from articles I've read, looks like it's being set up as a case that the people who have brought the case... Uh, whether they're truly interested in the rights of Asian Americans to get into Harvard or whether it's to, as, as you suggest, challenge affirmative action more broadly and constitutionally, this is a case likely headed for the Supreme Court at some point. So, uh, so I think we have to step back and get into the you know fundamental questions of what is affirmative action, what are why is it so controversial? And I also thought a great uh, vignette to, to illustrate or, or, or get us started in that conversation is one that you point out in, uh, in, your, in the introduction to your book, where you highlight the fact that Clarence Thomas and Sonia Sotomayor, both members of the Supreme Court, both benefited from affirmative action programs at Yale Law School. And yet Clarence Thomas talks about how the fact that he has been identified as a beneficiary of affirmative action experienced humiliation because of that, whereas Justice Sotomayor looks at the fact that she benefited from an affirmative action program as having given her an opportunity that she might not otherwise have had. So, we've, She says she's the perfect affirmative action baby, and yeah. she's very proud of it. Right. So, I, I mean... You can't talk about just affirmative action just in today's term, and that in today's terms, no. and that's why I think is is so important about the book. And I, I mean, I've studied American history and and read a great deal about the civil rights movement. But I'll tell you, I learned a lot about just how stark were the conditions of Black Americans in the 1950s. You know, we we imagine that with the passage of uh, with with the decision in Brown versus Board of Education by the Supreme Court that overnight, you know, we we did away with with segregated schools and with the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act in '64 and '65, just like that overnight, we we created a world of at least legal equality in our country. But the the stories that you tell about. Uh, from Reconstruction through through FDR's New Deal, uh, but not not only in terms of the Black American experience, but women's efforts to uh, get into the workplace and find uh, equal opportunities. You you need to have that background to to appreciate why affirmative action was was deemed necessary. Also, there was a belief initially. Uh, and what I, I call soft affirmative action, that all you had to do was open the doors of opportunity, and people who had previously been excluded, uh, people of color, women, uh, people with disabilities, Latinos, um, they would step forward, and before long, you would have that critical mass uh, that would essentially perpetuate it. And then you wouldn't have to worry about qualified black people applying because they would apply. And as I write in the book, only a bigot could oppose soft affirmative action. Mm -hmm. The problem was it wasn't enough. And so some government agencies began pushing for what I call a hard affirmative action, which involved numbers. And this is where we really get into the opposition to affirmative action. This is where you get all these stories about how white men were discriminated against um, uh, and how a lot of companies and universities uh, were told you hire by the numbers or else, that you lose your, your government contracts. And it just did not work. And the country has been split about this. Um, there are some people who believe this is what we have to do. You have to go 
further than just opening the doors of opportunity. You have to help people get through it. And sometimes this involves numbers. Um, a lot of other people believe this goes against the 14th Amendment, against the uh, Civil Rights Act. And part of the problem is this is essentially group rights. And we've never had group rights in the United States. This is much more European thing. Uh, the Constitution says no state shall deny any person. It does not say uh, no state shall deny any group. And we've seen the problem here from a constitutional point of view is that the Supreme Court has been as divided over, Supreme, over affirmative action as much as the American population. Yeah, excuse me a minute. <coughs> Sorry. No problem. Um, there hasn't been a single unanimous decision in an affirmative action case. They've all been uh, five to four, an occasional six to three. Mm. Well, <clears throat> and so there's this quote that you you uh, share from President Lyndon Johnson's speech, I believe it was to the Howard University graduating class, and right, he talks right. about this. And I think that's a great quote to help illustrate the difference between uh, those who think we shouldn't go any further than what you're calling soft affirmative action, where we encourage uh, people to walk through the doors of opportunity once they've been opened legally, like with, um, uh, you know, tearing down the, the legal restrictions to employment, let's say, uh, or even something like what Harvard does and other universities do, which is use race as a factor in order to achieve a more diverse student body versus harder forms of affirmative action that that emphasize quotas of some kind, set-asides for minorities uh, who have businesses that can get government contracts or quotas, uh, you know, firm quotas based on a group identity. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about that quote from LBJ and why that really set up the next 50 to 60 years of debate on, on affirmative action. Well, interestingly, um even opponents of affirmative action uh, believe that Johnson's speech was still... Oh, uh, hang on a minute. Um, decline. Are you there? I'm here. Okay, some another call tried to get through, and I'm not always quite sure what I'm supposed to, which <laughs> button I'm supposed to press. That's on this okay, call. I have the same problem. Um, um, Johnson said you can't keep a person in chains for years um, then struck off the chains, lead them up to the start of a race, and expect it to be a fair race. Uh, when they're competing against people who've been training, etc. Um, what he was talking about were African Americans who had had inferior educations, who had been uh, discriminated against by, you know, by Jim Crow. And so he says, freedom is not enough. You have to do something more. Now, there is... As I said, a number of critics of affirmative action still see Johnson's speech as soft. What he's saying, the, the more that he's talking about is that um, employers and colleges have to make an effort to recruit. Uh, but he's not talking about quotas. And in fact, the 1964 Civil Rights Act specifically says there are not going to be any quotas. Right. And then uh, one federal agency, the um, Equal Opportunity Commission uh, essentially ignored that. And I have a quote in the book from one of the employees who said, we don't care what they said, we're going to impose quotes. And uh, it was a disaster. It, um, that agency may have done some good, but it generated an enormous amount of ill will um, against affirmative action. And um, it wasn't the only cause of opposition to affirmative action, but it uh, the type it took, do it by the numbers, set up quotas if you don't do it. Um, it placed an enormous burden on companies, on uh, universities, uh, especially since, uh, I'll give you one example here. Um, there's no question that most schools had very, very few um, African-American faculty members. Uh, Harvard uh, in 1970 had one 
tenured woman faculty member out of, um, of almost 400. Um, so they wanted you go out higher, higher, higher. The problem was that black students had not yet gotten through college, much less into graduate school. It was the beginning of getting blacks into school. Mm-hmm. Um, there was one year when I think um, um, Duke was supposed to hire a black um, mathematician. But there were only two African-American uh, mathematicians who got their degrees that year. Um, in the university, we don't turn over very, very much. If somebody gets tenure, say, in their 30s, they're going to be there another 30 years. And um, what the government, the uh, commission, did not realize is that uh, universe, while students turn over every four years, faculty turn over every 40. Well, and to get and, to get to that position, even as you, you have to have gone to law school to have to be able to go to a good law school to get a good teaching job, right. you have to have gone to a good college. To go to a good college, you have to have had good secondary education. Good, you know, it starts exactly. all the way back, and and right. to the extent, and that's really that's a special problem when it comes to uh, positions like teaching positions in universities that really require you know, that kind of experience. You could fill this, the position with somebody, but are they going to be even remotely qualified? Um, we now have a pretty good-sized African-American middle class. Yeah. We also have... I, I, I gave a lecture up at Harvard last year, and I was amazed at the number of uh, not only women there, but women of color mm-hmm. and uh, men. So, I mean, you're getting there. But this thing doesn't happen overnight. Right. And um, whether, you know, Justice O'Connor said we might need affirmative action for another 25 years. She said that in the Michigan case. Um, and I thought that was rather naive. Well, I, that case was, wasn't that case a little, little bit more than 25 years ago at this point? Oh, just about. Well, right. it was in 03, so it's uh, not quite. All right, we're almost, years, we're almost there. Yeah. So, but we see that, I mean, but the opposition, it seems, to numbers-based uh, hard affirmative action does seem to come down to a, a, a feelings about competition at this point. Um, I mean, if you go back to the, to the 1930s and 1940s, I think there was much more, as you, as you described these periods, much more overt racism. Um, but uh, even and I found this fascinating that even through uh, through the period of the civil rights movement in the late 50s and 60s, even unions, which we today think of as being liberal or even progressive or even further left than that, took steps to keep African-American workers out of the better jobs in unionized, manuf- especially manufacturing facilities, because they were protecting the white workers. Well, they were protecting uh, more than that. You know, as I point out in the book, this goes all the way back to the medieval guilds, where um, skilled workmen would pass on their craft to their children. That was their property, whereas you know, uh, the, the landowners would pass on the land, um, this is what they had, and the Supreme Court for a long time recognized labor as property. And so here you had skilled workmen who had been, you know, uh, some of these unions, you couldn't get in on, uh, even into an apprentice program unless you were related to somebody who belonged to the union. And the unions wanted to protect that. They were not protecting just their own jobs, but they were protecting their families. And um, here comes the government says, you've got to take blacks now. And uh, this, you know, no matter how much they had discriminated before, uh, this really um, set off uh, unions. Um, one guy says, I waited 10 years to get my ticket, and they want it right now. They want my job. Yeah. And in some ways, he was right. Yeah. So, so, that's, so I was saying it's competition, um, but you're saying it's almost more a question of property and rights in in a sense that as soon as in you just dis- some of it was outright 
discrimination. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, even when a, uh, I use a story there where a black man who belonged to a union, he was a skilled craftsman, uh, he came to New York and the unions wouldn't let him in, they shut him out from jobs. Uh, there was ov- uh, overt discrimination, not, you know, when I say that they were protecting their jobs and jobs for their children, that's only part of the story. It was mm-hmm. also overt discrimination. So, I mean, and that's why it, it seems affirmative action has always been so controversial, because as soon as you do more than merely open the gate of opportunity, whether you're taking steps that still feel soft uh, because you're not put, imposing hard quotas, uh, or, or you move to something that is more n- numbers based, um, how else can you achieve or or be take the first steps to achieve uh, not equality well, in the in the outcome, the but equality in the opportunity? I mean, otherwise, in the union example, you're going to consign African American workers to the lowest skilled jobs, which will be the lowest paid jobs. And well, that that was pretty much the issue. Right. Um, you can do it. I mean, there are ways to do it without quotas. Um, Reynolds Metal is a good example. In fact, one of the best examples. Uh, Reynolds, which now is part of Alcoa, uh, was based in Richmond, Virginia. And the Reynolds family were uh, quite enlightened. And uh, essentially, as the civil rights movement gained some momentum, they realized that they had a work crew where all the skilled workers, the engineers, uh, salesmen, and others were white, and the only African Americans they had were janitors, or you know, pick and shovel people. Um, so they decided, <clears throat> excuse me, they were going to do something about this, and they hired an African American man for their personnel department. They told him, "You have one job, and one job only, and that is go out and recruit." engineers, metallurgists, and others who are qualified and will hire them. So he goes to uh, a job fair at a college, sets up the Reynolds table, and he's uh, sitting there, and all the African-American students just pass by. And he says, wait a minute, why, why aren't you stopping to talk to me? And he says, we know Reynolds doesn't hire blacks, and they kept walking. And, and he had a hard job convincing some blacks to apply, and they were hired. They were qualified, they were hired, and Reynolds essentially told their white workers, this is what we're doing, and if any of you don't feel that you can work alongside an African-American, you got two weeks' pay. Wow. Um, Now, the next year, he goes to the job fair, and he takes two of his hirees with him. Mm. And when black students now say Reynolds doesn't hire, he points to these two guys and says they work for Reynolds. Now, it took a while, but within 10 years, they had what I guess you could call a critical mass. But all of these minority people were hired because they were qualified. They never had a quota. Uh, They never had a goal. They wanted qualified African Americans in the pool so that for any given year when they went to see what they needed, there would be qualified African Americans there as well as others. In my mind, that was one of the best examples of how you could do affirmative action without uh, setting up a quota. Well, and 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 so that and so that is a great example of affirmative action. And but I guess here's the question: some some parts of our economy, some parts of our society, have experienced change through much more. uh, aggressive, much more intrusive, much more top-down approaches. I mean, we had uh, Harry Truman who desegregated the the U.S. military. Yeah. Um, there are uh, at different points along the way uh, uh, laws that and executive orders from the uh, from the president to set aside certain numbers of. Uh, government contracts, uh, and this has happened at the state level too, f- to minority-owned businesses, to yeah. uh, female, to women-owned businesses, and those have jump-started 
a lot of people's yes. economic ability so that they then can become mentors, they can be examples, they right. can hire, uh, you know, you know, people, they can provide training. That might not have happened so quickly. No, no. It, but, but for some of those moves. Harry Glassman once said that in order for us to get beyond race and gender, we're going to have to take race and gender into account for a while. Um, whereas the current Chief Justice believes that if you want to get past uh, race and gender, then you just stop using it. Um, I think Blackman was right. Uh, soft affirmative action wouldn't work by itself. It needed more. There were some situations that were so horrendous. Uh, the Alabama State Police case, Paradise versus United States, um, is one of these examples where the Alabama police um, just kept ignoring uh, court orders to hire African Americans. Finally, the Supreme Court said, um, for every white person you hire, you have to hire a black person, and for every white person you um, promote, you have to promote a black person. Um, and even some of the conservatives agreed that that case was so egregious uh, that you had to go to something like that. But um, for the most part, I, I think you're right, and uh, I do put this in the book, that soft affirmative action, while laudable, is not enough by itself, whereas hard affirmative action is always too much. And and, by, and again, by hard affirmative action, you're talking about actually not not only taking race into account, but but imposing quotas. Yes. Except in the most egregious case, like that police, that Alabama Police Department that you right. told about. Yeah. Right. So, so here we are, and you know, you you do a, a to not only to provide the historical context, but to give us the the background we need to understand today where we are and whether affirmative action has worked or not. I mean, you still see uh, tremendous inequality in terms of uh, economic position uh, between black and white Americans, between male and female uh, workers in terms of uh, salaries, in terms of rates of poverty, and all kinds of economic indicators you could point to. Uh, the small number of female CEOs of major companies today, even in the year 2020. So, uh, you know, if affirmative action is meant to be, as you pointed out, Justice Blackman says, we have in, in order to get to a point where we don't consider race, we're going to have to consider race. We're going to have to consider gender if we're talking about gender equality. Uh, and Justice O'Connor's comment that even if she was off in the number of years she thought it would take, the idea that this should be a temporary uh, fix, right? This is not to be a permanent all, all state. All advocates of affirmative action, all advocates of affirmative action believe it should be temporary. So, but so, that, that involves a belief that at some point we're going to hit a true equality between races, between men and women, and so that programs like affirmative action won't be needed anymore. Um, but our history doesn't seem to be going in that direction. There are more black middle class. There are more black uh, engineers, more blacks and you know, lawyers and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the scale is still tilted very much in favor of white. And sometimes it feels like the... Like the, the uh, like the problem just seems to move and bob and weave. I, I was fascinated too because this has been something that's been talked about a lot in terms of uh, college uh, admissions. That the SAT has been uh, criticized. The S the standard ap standardized aptitude test, the key test that you have to take when you apply to college, um, has a cultural bias that disfavors. Uh, particularly minority students who perhaps don't have exposure to the same education uh, that those in, in white neighborhoods and white suburbs would have access to. And no sooner does the SAT finally acknowledge that, yes, we agree that there is a cultural, in, indeed probably racial bias in, in the SAT, and they're going to start 
you, uh, providing a, something called an adversity score, now you start seeing many colleges and and around the country say, well, we're not going to consider standardized test results anymore at all. We're not even going to look at the test scores. I mean, what do you make of that? No, that in fact, George Washington did that. Uh, George Washington here in um, D.C., not the one in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. uh, about three, four years ago, they said that they would no longer require the SAT. And the year after that, they reported that they had more minority students in their class, uh, entering class, than they had when they did use it. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of schools now are saying that there are better indicators than the SATs. And um, now they're looking more at um, references from high school, how, how students did. All this is probably fair, but you still have the problem of um, how good are the schools, um, elementary and secondary schools, that uh, minority students go to? One of the things I say in my book is that, in some ways, affirmative action for women, at least getting into colleges and law school uh, and medical school and that sort of thing, was a lot easier. Mm -hmm. uh, because white women went to the same schools as their brothers did. And so they came out of secondary school with the same preparation uh, that white men did. Um, when they went to college, they went to the same colleges that their brothers did for the most part after, you know, most of the all-male colleges, um, uh, desegregated may not be the right word, but went co-ed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, and yet, for all those opportunities, while we have a lot of women lawyers and women doctors, etc., as you pointed out, very few CEOs. So, uh, so, so I wonder when you look at the history of affirmative action, and there are there are examples where we needed hard affirmative action, something more numbers based, more more of a quota system for a particular situation like the Alabama Police Department, or for a particular industry like government contractors or defense contractors. I wonder today. Um, where we have such a different awareness, not to say that we don't still have racism, not to say that we don't have many ways in which there is uh, gender inequality in our economy, in opportunities and promotions, CEOs of companies, as, as an example, because we do, we have these deeply rooted in our culture and our society and our economy. But I wonder if having gone through the experience, however tumultuous it's been, how as controversial as it's been, as you look back at that history, do you see that we've, ma we've made progress to the point where more of the hard types of affirmative action are less necessary? I hope so. Um, but I couldn't swear to it. One of the things... I point out in my book is that you cannot assume that every person of color or woman or Latina or a person in a wheelchair is there because of affirmative action. Uh, the Latina may be there because the bank needs a Spanish-speaking um, teller in a neighborhood where there's a lot of um, uh, Latin American customers. Uh, the wheelchair person may be there because the company has a, uh, um, a program favoring veterans. Um, so, you know, when you look at somebody in a position, um, you cannot assume that that person is there because of affirmative action. Well, also, also, uh, Mel, more and more, that Latina could be there because she's super qualified for the job. Uh, exactly. Right. I mean, uh, I... I I tell the story of uh, um, some faculty members who were, uh, you know, said that, that their students even questioned whether they were qualified because they thought they were affirmative action hires. Mm -hmm. uh, when some of them, you know, were at the head of their class, had uh, good dissertations, you know, degrees from Harvard and Yale, and yet Harvard didn't give out degrees because you were black. You still have to earn it. And... Um, we're getting past that now to some extent, uh, but there's, um, you know, right now with the economy the way it is, um, it's easy 
uh, when companies expand, it's very easy to pick up more people of color, more minorities. But um, should the economy go down, um, you have the you know the first problem is last hired, first fired, which means that if companies start letting people go, it will be the minorities they let go. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Schools had no trouble getting more minority students in when they were expanding in the 60s and 70s. Um, now you have some schools that are beginning to contract. And um, what's that going to mean for minority admissions? It's um, it's a problem that's not going to go away and it's not going to get any easier. Well, the other or, or another issue when it comes to admissions to universities like Harvard and others is that uh, you can play a definitions game too. If you just look at Harvard's admissions, you, you you're going to see how they f- try to fill their class with diversity as as a goal, just as filling a football team is is a goal, as we were talking about uh, in the beginning. But if you look at elite private colleges as the group, or if you look at uh, top 100 colleges as the group. You know, it really depends on how you define it. People aren't entitled to a Harvard, uh, you know, to a seat in the Harvard freshman class in any given year. But you want to you, you want to make sure that there are opportunities. And uh, to, I think we can also lose sight because here we are in 2020, and probably a lot of people don't think about the ways in which. Uh, we still experience uh, adverse consideration of race, adverse consideration of gender, even today. I mean, there is this scandal of all these wealthy movie stars and other, yep. you know, people who were who were basically buying their way into elite colleges. Uh, I don't recall any of those being uh, African American or. Um, nope. Or or Latino Americans, they were. right? They were these are whites that are taking advantage of money privilege to buy their way well, you know, into it, these things. That that's sort of an outlier to some extent, although it's very much related to the legacy problem. Yes, um, where you know if you're a donor to a college, your child has a much better chance of, of getting in, and all the private schools do this because they want to keep that money flow going. But, you know, back in the, um, well, it's almost two decades now, uh, Derek Bach and another person wrote The Shape of the River, which was the most com- comprehensive look at uh, affirmative action in higher education. Um, they looked at, I think, close to 70,000 students in something like 30 schools. But the point I want to make here is when they make that, most of the debate over affirmative action does not deal with all of higher education. It deals with a relatively small number, the Ivy Leagues, the public Ivies, the Seven Sisters, that sort of thing, the very elite schools. Otherwise, uh, for the majority of colleges and universities, the big state universities out in the Midwest, almost everybody can get in. Mm -hmm. Um, In in Virginia, for example, uh, the University of Virginia is an elite school, so is the College of William and Mary. But they both have articulation arrangements with the state um, extensive community college system. So if you can't get into UVA the first time, you can go to a um, community college near you, do well, and you will automatically get transferred into UVA. Right. I know the University of Maryland so, has the same program through its community right. colleges. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, there, uh, you've got to keep in mind that most of the debate over affirmative action in higher education really revolves around a couple, not a couple, more than that, uh, but a, a couple dozen elite schools. Now, as Columbia graduates, we know that being the graduate of an elite school is a big um, Plus for it. Um, and so I'm not, you know, saying that every, but you can only take so many. Right. And um, when you can't get in, uh, there, there's a wonderful cartoon I saw where uh, there are four people, five people lined up. Um, one of them is wearing a, a sign saying soccer player. Another one is saying um, 
office location, and the fourth one is um, a, a person of color, um, and the, the fifth person is didn't get in, and he's jumping up and down, pointing to the black person. You're the reason I didn't get in. Mm. Now, there's a um, a lot of reasons why people don't get into school, just as well as there are a lot of reasons why they do. Right. Well, so th- just to finish then where we started with this Harvard case um, and the Asian American, the, mm. the allegations that they were discriminating against Asian Americans, I guess because there were far more Asian American students qualified who, who didn't get in. Um, right. Although I think that is something that we you could probably see at any elite university, which is far more qualified students. I mean straight A's and perfect SAT or SAT scores, and you still didn't get oh, yeah. it. I mean, that happens all the time every day. Um, but nonetheless, this case where the federal trial judge found that considering race in order to achieve a laudable goal of diversity was not unconstitutional. Um, but this this lawyer <laughs> you mentioned, Bloom, who wants to see this taken all the way up, well, he, he's not a he's not a lawyer, but he's the one who heads the students' affair admission. Oh, I see. Okay. And his, he's what in, he's counting on now is that the two newest appointees to the court, mm-hmm. um, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, uh, will tilt the balance. Now, um, most of the affirmative action cases that have um, supported colleges, you know, and have said that diversity is a compelling, you know, governmental interest. Uh, nearly all these cases have been five to four. And Anthony Kennedy and whom Gorsuch, uh, whom uh, Kavanaugh replaced, mm-hmm. and Sandra Day O'Connor, whom Gorsuch replaced, were people, I'm sorry, a lead replaced, um, O'Connor and um, Kennedy, Kennedy mm. in the end, supported affirmative action. They're gone now, and what Bloom is counting on is that the two um, uh, Trump appointees will oppose it. He may be right. Uh, it's very, very hard to tell what the court does. Well, what would that look um, like? Would that would that mean that taking into consideration race, even for an affirmative goal, an affirmative action goal of diversity, let's say, without hard quotas, that that would be unconstitutional? Is that where they're... Uh, is very that likely. Where, oh, my goodness. Very likely. And that, that's his, his bet, that the new makeup of the court um, will go um, against affirmative action. I would not be so rash as to predict how the court will go. Mm-hmm. Uh, at this point, um, you know, there are some cases, there's some precedents, um, and then during, you may recall that during the Michigan case, we had those 60-some-odd amici briefs, including from former generals and heads of military academies and CEOs, that carried a lot of weight with the court. Mm-hmm. This was the and, Michigan Law um, School case you're talking about. Right. Yeah. And um, my guess is that if there is a serious challenge, that you may see something like that again. Mm-hmm. Um whether, but you know, he, Supreme Court justices are weird people in many ways. It's so hard to predict uh, which way they will go. Um, Anth- uh, Antonin Scalia, you know, very conservative, uh, nonetheless, you know, wrote some of the strongest opinions supporting uh, rights of the accused of anybody. And, um, in the debate over um, campaign finance, for example, which I'm working on now, um, you can't really break it down as liberal versus conservative because the arguments of the justices who oppose campaign finance reform are based on First Amendment and echo the brief submitted by the American Civil Liberties Union, which is arguably the most liberal group in the country. Right. Well, so, um, 
it does seem like it would be incredibly disruptive in every facet of our economy, of our culture and society to suddenly say that even in the case of softer forms of, uh, of, of affirmative action where, say, we're a company or a, a university or the government itself is uh, recruiting, promoting, training, offering uh, certain uh, spots to uh, people of color, to women, and so forth as a, as a way of achieving a goal of diversity, it would be so disruptive to, to declare that as a matter of constitutional principle, you can't take race into consideration in any way. Um, well, I, I agree it would be disruptive, but that's pretty much what Brown v. Board of Education did, isn't it? Mm. That was disruptive. That is true. So it, it's always hard. Um, you know, uh, I go to, when I talk, and people say, what do you think the court's going to do about X? Uh, what I always say is, I'm a historian. I only know what happened. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. And um, with the Supremes, you never can tell. Well, I will say this, Mel, and again, I was, uh, uh, you know, the Super Bowl was okay, but reading your book last night was, <laughs> was a lot more interesting. Um, I, I, I am a big believer that you have to know the history uh, in order to appreciate where we are and where we're going. And uh, and your book uh, really fills a huge uh, hole in in my un understanding of this issue, and uh, I, I really recommend people uh, get a copy of the Affirmative Action Puzzle: uh, A Living History from Reconstruction to Today by my guest Melvin Yurofsky. It is by I think it's University of California Press. Is that right? No, no, no. This is Athenaeum. It's a, an imprint of Knopf. Ah, okay. Well, we will put a link to the book so people can get easy access to it, and hopefully they'll pick up a copy. Uh, and I want to thank you, Mel, very much for being on the podcast with me today. I re really enjoyed the conversation. It was my pleasure. I enjoyed it, too. Take care.